So good morning. Good almost afternoon. In the first service, I don't know if uh, they said, but in the first service, they were still doing worship till about this time. So, which is awesome. That means I get to preach way longer. The worship team was having a bit of a coup. They're like, I know how to get them to stop preaching this long. <laughs> so that was, the, that was the ploy, and it didn't work, Melinda. The ploy to extend worship so I'd preach shorter. <laughs> no, wasn't that... Oh, you know. <laughs> I was going that fast? <laughs> well, the 11 o'clock service, we could just keep going and it's all good. Well, I have a couple of announcements for you and then we'll jump into the message. So, here it goes. There's supposed to be a bit of a church picnic today and it's raining. So, we will not have a church picnic, uh, it's, but if you want to go or invite someone out for lunch or go to each other's homes... Today would be a fabulous day to do that. For those who are camping online, watching this around the fire in the rain, you should be in church. Um, that's, uh, every time it rains, I, that, I'm going to go with that, always. So, but today, uh, Cassidy, are you here? Cassidy's here. So Cassidy's been working with Safe Families for a while. How many of you have heard of Safe Families? Safe Families organization, and what they do is they are wanting to help families that are in need. Um, within a community so that there's not like greater intervention that has to take place. So like if there's a family, uh, let's say a single mom and, and some kids, we sometimes take it for granted perhaps in the church that we can call someone who can maybe help us or, or have family that is close by. But if you move here, if you come here from another country and you come all alone, some of these support groups aren't there. And for me, like to ask my mom to look after our kids for a weekend so Kendra and I could get away, was like awesome, and we just take it for granted, but a lot of people, they can't, and so uh, this organization is trying to mobilize believers and Christians to say, why don't we help to adopt and care for and love these people so that children don't get apprehended um, as quickly? There's opportunity to step in prior to that. So Cassie's been working with them for a while, but she's going to start an Anchor Point group that is going to meet today for the first time at 2 p.m., and what it is a group that's going to know God, they're going to care for each other and pray, but... They want to put their attention or their focus onto a family or two or three that are in the community, whenever the needs rise. And, and then together as a group, give care. So if it's like, mom just needs to get some grocery shopping done, maybe she hates grocery shopping, so then a few people from the group can go grocery shopping for the mom. Or maybe it's the other way around where mom would actually just like to have a little bit of time alone to go grocery shopping and maybe come and care for the kids or invite them to come to your group or go bring dinner, or whatever that would be to create family. And if you just meet once in a blue moon and just when the need is there, it's tough. But when it's a group that is caring for each other and we're adding into this now to give care to community, it's, it's really brilliant. So if you're planning to go to the picnic or not, but you'd like to hear about it more or participate or meet Cassidy and the crew, uh, two o'clock here at the church, they're going to meet and you won't even get rained out. All right, no other questions. Perfect. Camp day amazing. Yesterday, 35 people came to work at camp. It, oh, man. We'll get, some, uh, we'll get some photos up or a video next week. But uh, bunk beds got sanded so kids won't get slivers or other people that are going to stay in them. Uh, cabins clean, chapel, all the wood got put up in the chapel. We hauled away like an entire big trailer load of garbage. The beach area got masterfully worked with. Obram and Timothy, thank you took out uh, an abandoned sunk bridge and just clawed that thing out of the water. And we have a big stack of that, which is lovely. It's been there a long time. Cut grass, extended the play field, built new pathway, or not new pathway, refixed a pathway that had washed away. Uh, we got done so quick that people went canoeing. We sat and got sunburns. We swam in the lake. Uh, it was just wonderful. So we'll have another one in a few weeks. And if you'd like to come, you can. Oh, and we ate food. So if you are gluten-free, we had an all-meat diet. Uh, <laughs> and if you like gluten, there was extra buns. So uh, if, you have, uh, if, if you have dietary needs, you can either let me know or you can bring your own food because I'm not very good at making those things. I'm learning. Okay, I want to care for you, but I'm not very good at it. So that sums up the day, and the next day is coming up soon. So you can sign up or you can just show up, and we'll attempt to bring enough food there with us. Um, it was really fun because like trucks and trailers showed up and all the 
toys just came rolling off the trailers. And uh, it was just Operation Mobilization. I know that's a mission organization. That is June 10th. Five churches, one body. We're having uh, the five pastors and their churches that we've been meeting together. We're uh, meeting together every week. We're going to meet here, have a worship and prayer night. We'd love it if you'd come. It's Friday night. And one of the, one of the heart cries for at least two of the pastors is that they're working with uh, Filipino community and Arabic or Egyptian communities. And really hard, when you go to a new country, you'd like to stay with the people that you know where you feel comfortable. And these pastors have a desire to help their congregations get integrated and know people and have a relationship with people that are outside, uh, that, that live and have lived in Canada to help them because they come because they want to be Canadian. They want to engage that way, but hard to find friends within the Christian church when the community is based in Tagalog or in Arabic. And so coming together, this is one of their desires is they're going to meet more people in the body of Christ um, that we love and trust and care for each other and would love it if you would come and just love and pray together with them, come early and care for people that are walking in the doors and meet them. And I think it'll be just a tremendous time. Sound good? All right. I think it will be fabulous. And if all of a sudden you want to bring food, we have no plan for food because we're like five pastors that don't do food very well. Um, And the Filipino community, they they have this thing called uh, something chocolate, which is like pork blood that gets cooked in a looks like chocolate and tastes like pork blood. And it's like a delicacy that they love, and I just would prefer not to have that. <laughs> but if they have it, and it's here, and you're like, oh, like chocolate fondue, like just straight face, enjoy it. Has anyone ever had this before? Okay, it's delightful, isn't it? Yeah, right, oh, yeah, it's great. <laughs> yeah, it's, it looks really good. <laughs> so... Uh, Again, I don't really have a plan for it. Maybe by June 10th we will. But if you're like, do you know what? I'd just like to bring some cookies or snacks. You can. And that'd be awesome. All right. Acts chapter 20. You ready for it? Uh, we, we're not going to make it very far in. Uh, but we're going to see how far we make it in Acts chapter 20. But I want to uh, pray and then uh, let's, let's jump into it. So God, grateful for today. Thank you, God, for the gift of rain to replenish Uh, God, I think there's a lot of farmers who got seed in the ground, so this could be really good. They're still flooding. God, I don't know how you balance this stuff out, all the prayers that people have for stopping rain and bringing rain and flood and no flood and water. And God, I don't know how, but I'm grateful that you're in charge, that you're in control, that you are the king, that you love us, and so grateful for that. So today, thank you for how rain will be a benefit, and we give you praise. Thank you, God, for a beautiful day at camp in which we could work together and make new friendships. That's a gift, God. Thank you for the the opportunity to praise and to worship. And God, an amazing time of putting our attention upon you, Jesus. It's just a gift today. Thanks for new friendships that are being formed. And God, thank you that as we're trying to find our feet coming out of a a two-year pandemic, God, that you're teaching us how to care for each other and love each other and God, please teach us more. Help us to be faithful in that, to above everything, love you and love each other. God, if we can, we can do that, that would be amazing. Thanks, God. I pray that your spirit would lead us today, that you would be the teacher here today. Capture our hearts, God, and help us understand. We love you lots, and we give you praise for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Throughout the last number of weeks, I've had the great joy of meeting with several people. Some of you are in here today, and there's sort of a common theme that it feels like for me a common theme that has been coming up throughout the last couple of weeks. And so before I get into Acts 20, I want to go down a, another road that I think is going to help, and it's to help us understand Anchor Point. Maybe it helps you understand me a little bit. Maybe it helps you understand like what we want to do here and what this looks like. But the question that has come up is related around the word truth. And I talk about it lots. Uh, It's something that is a value for me, like be hungry for what's true. And you'll hear me say this, I'm like a broken record. Love each other and be hungry for the truth. That's like, that's about all my messages and I just cloak it a different way. But how do we find it? Like, What's at the heart of like the Christian's walk? Like, are we looking for knowledge? Are we looking for things that are true? Are we just loving? Like, what are those things? And what happens if our theologies don't line up? Like, what happens if the truths we believe are, are different than someone else's? Is that immediately the reason to, to move and go to a different church, to find a different community? Like, what, what, is, what does this look like? So, 
As I've been thinking through this, uh, a couple of years ago, I, I spent some tri- time putting together a vision statement for the church, and none of you have seen it, basically. And the reason why you haven't seen it is because I haven't known if we should have a vision statement. Like, everyone has one, and everyone has a vision statement and value sta- values, but like, but like, why do we have them? And is it just because every business in the world has been taught that this is what they should do, so the churches do it? Because I'm like, that wouldn't be a good reason. Now, I can surmise Jesus had a vision for himself, right? There's a, it, it talks about this in Isaiah, and he goes and he articulates it in the temple. Um, Paul, he knew what his main purpose was to be. Jesus did. Peter, like they had these main things, but I just didn't know if we should. I, I'm, I wasn't opposed to it. I just didn't know. So put together a vision statement, and it was like really nice, and it didn't miss anything. It was like diplomatic enough. It was enough that it wouldn't offend anybody. It was inclusive for everyone. It was inspiringly boring. And, uh, but I thought we had nailed it. And uh, so I had a friend of mine who, this is what he does for a living. He works with organizations. I said, David, I, I, I want you to go through this, this vision statement that I've been working on. And uh, not just me, sorry, a team of us had kind of worked on. Like, can you like just dissect it, look at it? Like, is it good or is it not? So he reads through it, and his words were like, Donovan, it's really nice. There's nothing that's really missing in here. Like, it's just really nice. I said, oh, cool. Um, and it's like every other vision statement I've ever seen. And like, when I talk with you, like, I'm inspired. And when I read the statement, it's like, it doesn't seem anything like you or your church. It just, it's kind of boring. <laughs> So he pushed me to try to put something together in a different way. And, uh, and he goes like, if you could tell your people one thing, if you could have anyone in the world have one thing that they would get, what would it be? And one of the first words out of my mouth is that the people would be hungry to know the truth. That was it. I, I just wish they would just be hungry for that. And then from there, it started to develop. Like, what part of that do I want? Like, why is that important? What, what are the pieces in there that are valuable? So I thought what I would do today is I had some people help me put this together some time ago, put a, a little slideshow because I have no idea how to do it. And it was to put together a vision statement. And I haven't publicized it because I'm not sure I'm, I've nailed it. But I think for the purpose of what we're doing today, it's going to at least help us in the discussion so that you would go, oh, that's what is going on. That helps me understand. Oh, that's why Donovan doesn't or the team doesn't do this or does this. I think it will help bring some clarity. So the vision statement that maybe is not quite as boring is this, and I'll explain it. A community of hungry people pursuing truth and love in a spirit of awe and wonder. Just look at it for a little bit and just have it sink in, and then I'll go through the, the statement here for you. A community of hungry people pursuing truth and love in a spirit of awe and wonder. So let me, let me go through these slides or to help explain and put it together for you um, to understand. So the information era is here to stay. We've all heard about this year in the 2000s. Information is it. But the question that I always have is what information is true? Yes, we've talked about this. What information is actually true? So I just wrote down, the truth hasn't changed. The the truth is still there, but the process to discover what is true, that has changed. And we have more access to information today, truth today, but like it's, it's almost become so much information, it's like we can't figure out what is actually true. The science world has a way in which they pursue truth too. Someone puts together, does a study, and here it is, and they allow everybody else to dig in, and the more times that people prove that their hypothesis is right, the more likely we say it's a high probability that it's true. Doesn't necessarily mean it's 100%, but the more times it's been peer reviewed, the more chance that it's true. So truth, that hasn't changed. If there is aliens on another planet um, and God put them there, whether we have ever seen them or believe it, if they are there, it's true. But the discovery of finding out if it is or isn't that's a process that we are in right now. Does that make sense? Just because someone says, I saw an unidentified flying object in the sky and I heard these words that came out of the sky that said this, doesn't make it true. 
but it's the discovery, and we're trying to put these pieces together. The culture has seduced us towards individualism, true or false. Toward individualism, you weren't convinced of this. Self-centeredness and the need to be right. I believe this is what has happened. So I ask the question, can the truth be discovered in isolation or alone? That's one of the questions I wanted to answer. I think there's a shift that is taking place within the body of Christ. Now, I believe one of the greatest challenges for pastors and leaders today is the dynamic of the shift of my age and older. You can make assumptions of what my age is. And my age and younger. And it's different because we've grown up. I grew up without the internet until I was an adult and married. Basically, it didn't exist. And the era below me grew up with full accessibility to everything. And so how we approach it has come so quick. But I think people are coming together to enjoy the process of discovery together um, and then responding in praise and wonder. That is different than before. In the generation I grew up, you came to church in particular to be told what is true. And so you come and you listen to a pastor. They finally tell you this is what's true. You should do this and this and not that and not that. And we tell you what is true. Close the book and you go home and you do your very best without asking questions to do what you were told is the right thing to do. Okay, I'm exaggerating to make a point. But on this side, I think there is, with so much information, Donovan by no means has access to better information than you do, nor can I put as much time into every Christian subject known to mankind. I can't do that, and so it's not just Donovan coming to do it, it's how do we grow in truth together? That's a, a shift that's taking place. Let's look at how the gospel has formed over the generations. Early church, which is what we've been reading about in the book of Acts, the gospel was heard and lived out entirely in community. Okay, Paul would come in, he's teaching, he leaves them, I'm going to come back. They are learning how to be Christians and live. They don't have, Bi they don't have a Bible, they don't have access to it. They, they know some of the scriptures from before, but they don't have day-to-day -day access. But it's all lived out in community. Paul, teacher, comes in, don't forget this, don't forget this. Helping them get it, they live it out in community. Middle Ages, again, this is not 100%, it's just getting it down. Bible was then handwritten by monks. They would get together in isolation and write and write and write. And then it was read, um, sometimes within different languages that was appropriate for the people, read and lived out again in community. We get to the 1500s. Bibles began to be made available to communities. The Bible was read by the people, but understood through clergy. Again, it wouldn't necessarily be under, like, Clearly understood, you might have like Old English, a, a huge portion of the, the population was still illiterate, so they would have access to it, but now there was another trend, and people had to learn how to read, and so public education was going to come into play so that people could learn, so we could finally get to this in our hands today. Get to the 1900s, Bibles available to all, this is like the beginning of personal devotions. Like personal devotions wasn't a thing, we talk about it today like everyone's been doing it for all of Christendom, and no. No, there wasn't a thing as like, I'm going to go sit with my Bible and journal and coffee in an easy chair. <laughs> that wasn't really a thing. Clergy devoted to the study and teaching of the Bible because we had access to like seminary, libraries. We had the ability and, and to go in and we could devote significant portions of our time to study and prayer. But we get to the 2000s, the information era, and the best teaching and resources are available to all. Everybody. Not limited to seminaries, pastors are no longer the experts of Christian truth, and we have an equal playing field, okay? That's a really good thing, to have an equal playing field. Everyone can have a relationship. I think we've really progressed a long way. It just brings about a different set of struggles or a way in which to engage. And so I write it like this because really it, it took hundreds of years for there to be a significant shift and another hundreds of years section and now all of a sudden we get to 2000 it was like now and it's like it's on steroids like uh, what's worse than steroids I mean more intense speed <laughs> I wouldn't know I read it in a book okay so today <laughs> in my head that was funny it just sounded fast because it was speed um and then I'm thinking of uh, Lightning McQueen, I am speed. That's where my brain goes. Okay, so today we have knowledge overload. Okay, we believed that enough knowledge would lead us to knowing Jesus better. That's what we believed would happen. And is that the case? 
maybe for some, but for the most part, not really. Truth, I believe, is not something that is attained. It's not like you finally have enough knowledge and now you know. Now you got it. Now you're brilliant. Truth is something to be explored. And I'll explain this a little bit. I believe that if we think we have attained the truth, the journey ends and we become our own truth. I think we've seen this on mass display the last two years. And it leads us towards the worship of self. But the hungry, this is important, the hungry who continue to pursue truth and love, they will find out that Jesus was leading them all along. You know the story of like the road to Emmaus, like Jesus is walking and the disciples are with them and he just resurrected and they didn't know it was him at first and they're like, but they said like, like our hearts burned within us, like inside. And that is like what we're talking about here. Jesus was leading, oh, you were with me, you were walking with me and that should lead us to wonder and worship. The church, it was established to discover and know the person of truth. That's really different than to know truth. Now we're learning a person, and the person's name is? There's a hint. Uh, I don't know if you see it up there. <laughs> <laughs> to know the person of truth, who is who? Yeah, Jesus. That's really good. You're like, I don't want to talk. But it requires some things to discover Jesus. In, in my perspective, it requires hunger. It requires love. It's explored together in community. It transforms the way that we live, but it also invites other explorers on the adventure. It does this because in community, like we, we grow quicker in knowing God when there's different people approaching it differently, but together we're trying to seek him. So we've learned that there continues to be a massive decline in the Western church. People have become increasingly isolated and the last two years has gone over the top with that. Social media has perpetuated self-satisfying echo chambers. So no one likes losing, so we naturally just find a team that speaks our truth. You can imagine how that is gonna work out, right? When you think that you can arrive at the truth so you find everyone who believes what you do, you've nailed it or not. This does not lead to finding the truth. What it does, in my opinion, is it perpetuates what you perceive to be true. Truth isn't subjective. Fear limits our pursuit of truth. Qu questions like, I might look dumb, or I will be rejected, or if people really know who I am, would they still be my friend? These are real for people in the pursuit of truth. And so in the pursuit of it, if I, don't, if I don't speak something, let's say, with authority for some people, they'll kind of panic because it's like, whoa, 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 be sure of what you're saying. Um, like, what if people hear it wrong? What if they get it wrong? And, and those are legitimate, but I believe that actually we need to pursue and get hungry and wonder and explore and invite together. The discovery of truth begins in relationship, and this is why we wrote Hungry People Pursuing Truth and Love Together. Does that make sense? Hungry people, who are they? They're trustworthy, they're kind, they're not self-seeking, they're excited for the truth, they're gentle. These would be some descriptors, perhaps. They have a purpose to keep discovering, to seek the kingdom, and to patiently walk with others who aren't on the same step or length of the journey, but they're on the journey, and we have to be patient with them. Growing to become things like vulnerable and honest. More loving of someone, the more you know of someone. People who love without condition. Excited about the exploration of knowing God and seekers of God because they have grown in love for God. Genuine in their love and care for others. That sounds good, yes? But we're growing to become like that. If you want to be like, what, what are our values, perhaps? It's like th this. This is like, this is what we're attempting to be, and it's actually an inner part. It's a transformation inside that comes from knowing the person who is truth, and his name is? We're getting better. Anchor Point Church is these things, at least we hope to be, to be simple, to be grassroots, to be deeply loving, 
to be authentic, fun. <gasps> That's horrible. <laughs> Can you imagine if you had fun ever? <laughs> Don't come to camp work day because that will not be fun. But it might be incredibly fun. Anyway, okay, relational, adventurous, and creative. Anchor Point Church doesn't entertain you, plan your Christian calendar of events, and doesn't demand your time. We're not interested. We want this changed by knowing him, Jesus. Anchor Point Church attempts to do these things, to worship God, to dig into the Bible, to equip the body of Christ, to share about the kingdom. We'd like to plant churches, and we don't want to do it alone. We want to partner together with others in the body of Christ. We believe that all have gifts, everyone in the body, to be explored. Who are wel who's welcome here? Hungry people are welcome. We are better together than alone, and truth continues to be discovered, and yet the truth doesn't change, because Jesus doesn't change. Who's the truth? Jesus. This is the truth. So Anchor Point Church, a community of hungry people pursuing truth and love in a spirit of awe and wonder. Does that make sense? So I don't know if I've, if I've nailed it, but this is at the heart of why I explore, why we engage. I don't want groups in the church because it's nice to have a program with groups. That's why I, I struggle in it. Like, I would like it to be authentic. I would like you to desire to grow. And you're like, uh, you want to grow with me? I, des I desire that you would want to come early, not because I tell you, but to meet someone who might be encouraged or inspired or will encourage or inspire you that together we are a community of hungry people, that together we're pursuing truth and love and that we never lose awe and wonder. And I put that in there very specifically because I think we do that. We get weird. We're like, we nailed it. I'm going to teach everyone and I'm going to write a book. <laughs> and I love books. But I'm going to write a book so that everyone knows the truth finally because I got it. No. No. What we want it first to do before it moves into be a best-selling book <laughs> is turn your eyes onto him and turn to worship. Oh, God, that's it. Oh, I get it. I, I understand. That, that makes sense to me, God. This is what we desire that when hungry people find or discover the person of Jesus, all we can do is worship him. Um, what I don't want is, here's the 10 steps that, that's going to inspire you to be a good Christian. Not interested. I want you to know him, the one, Jesus. This is eternal life, says in John 17, that they would know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That's the desire. Truth is, who? Jesus. Jesus. This is the center of all that we want to pursue. We go after truth. This is Jesus. Jesus is the truth. This is why I ask questions when I preach and I don't have all the answers. I have a lot of opinions. I have a lot of ideas, and many of them have been tested, and I think they're good. But five years ago, I had some different beliefs because I didn't know when I became a lead pastor that I'd be confronted with so many questions questions of looking at scripture different than the way I looked at scripture and I was like I never saw that and what about this and it opened up this well and a desire to discover and it's freeing when Donovan doesn't have to be the the one who knows everything crazy right like I don't have to have this thing licked or memorized like I have it memorized and I know everything about it <laughs> But actually, like you don't, but how beautiful when you meet with people and they're telling you something they discovered and then you get to ask questions and wonder and I haven't always been good at it because somewhere inside you kind of think like, but what if they got it wrong? Like, I wouldn't want them to burn in hell so I better just stick it to them and make it hurt and tell them the truth. Right? Isn't that inspiring? But what actually if it's a discovery of knowing a person? Like what if, what if that really is the case? Ask questions and wonder and explore. The questions though, they have to come out of a heart that is hungry, which is why it's in there. Because if it's a heart trying to prove that you're right, like I talked last week, you're just going to be hurt. Curiosity 
genuine curiosity or hunger is necessary in the exploration of this. If it's not, if it's not curious to know Jesus and its desire to be right, we're going to end up with conflict and chaos in the church, and we'll just have divide all over the place. So, throughout the series on Acts, everything we you have to go back if you haven't listened to them all, but everything in there seems to say that everything from the Old Testament or the Old Covenants were fulfilled in the person of Jesus. Everything fulfilled there. So all of the laws in the Old Testament, including the Ten Commandments, and some of you are going to think I'm heretical unless you go back and listen to the message. I won't go into today, but everything, all of those are fulfilled. And so now we're in the New Covenant and we follow these laws or these rules or the way of the kingdom of heaven. And so you can go back and you can look at it. It's, it's on YouTube or a podcast, whatever you'd like to do that way. We no longer have an obligation, in my perspective, to follow any of the Old Testament laws. So because of that, this begs a question that I get into and a problem when I get into Acts chapter 20. So what do you do when you're like, okay, Old Testament, we don't need to live it out. That was specific laws for a specific group of people at a specific time. There are some of those things that are maybe universal or, or, or good and they're, they're part of the nature of God. But then he tells us about it in the New Testament. And so I got into a problem when I got into the book of Acts chapter 20. So again, in the Old Testament, all the law and the prophets are all pointing to Jesus. Everything is coming full cycle. So Everything from the Old Testament is like a shadow or like foreshadowing or foretelling what is to come. And so we have things like the sacrifices. Do we still sacrifice today? No, you can tell. I would be in unreal shape if I was throwing beef all day on an altar. No, why? Because we have someone who was sacrificed for us. Who was that? Jesus. So we don't, we don't do the sacrifices. Worship in the temple. Why did they go there? They didn't have the Holy Spirit indwelt. They needed to go to the temple to be in the presence of God. This is where the Spirit of God would dwell, usually. We have the feasts. These were reminders and like things to, to keep in their perspective that they needed to remember who God was, where they came from, where they're going. And these are the things that were there. So we get to a question, and I'm going to read the first seven verses of Acts chapter 20. And there are some hard names in here. So... I will blow it. Okay, my name is not Daryl. Daryl would have him licked. <laughs> when the uproar had ended, Paul sent for the disciples and, after encouraging them, said goodbye and set out for Macedonia. Remember, there was a big uproar that happened in the end of chapter 19. He traveled through that area, speaking many words of encouragement to the people, and finally arrived in Greece, where he stayed three months. Because some Jews had plotted against him, just as he was about to sail for Syria, he decided to go back through Macedonia. He was accompanied by a lot of people. Sopater, son of Phyrus, from Beria, Aristarchus, and Secundus, I hope you're getting all these, these are names for children, from Thessalonica, Gaius from Derby, Timothy also, Ty Tychicus, that's a good name for your kid, Trophimus, Truf I'm blowing it here for you on purpose, I think. From the province of Asia. These men went on ahead and waited for us at Troas. But we sailed from Philippi after the festival of unleavened bread and five days later joined the others at Troas, where we stayed seven days. Verse seven. On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. You're like, really? That's where you're gonna stop? Yeah. I was like, on the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. My God, I don't know why that is so important, but for some reason, that is standing out. On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Breaking of the bread, this is something that when believers gather together, often the, the, the Jews, they would do this on which day? On the Sabbath, right? But I was like, on the first day, what day of the week is the first day? Sunday. What day do the Jews uh, have Sabbath? Saturday, it's like, uh-oh, and my conflict began. And there's a sect of the church that is like, you must meet on Saturday. It's the only holy day. It was set up by God, and so we must go there. And if that were true, we should change our day of meeting to 
Saturday. But here, I found it. The church got it right. On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Jews got it wrong. It says right here. So we should clearly meet on Sunday. Right? Okay. <laughs> and that's it. Okay. We'll move on to the next. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. So the question for me for a long time is Sabbath. So in the Bible it says, in the Old Testament I mean, it says, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. But if, we, if it's true that we don't have to follow the Old Testament law and it was fulfilled, then do we still need to keep a Sabbath today? That's the great question that I have that I want to sort this out with. So let me just jump ahead here a little bit. So this, this, this week I decided I'm going to look at the New Testament alone and I'm going to read every single Bible verse that talks about the Sabbath and see what the New Covenant requires, what it says, what we're supposed to do. Seems like an appropriate thing to do. So again, knowing the Old Testament, this new belief that I have, oh, they're all fulfilled, then okay, what does the New Testament say? Well, I knew the one popular verse that I've used many a time in sermons, Mark chapter 2, 27, 28. This is Jesus. He said, then he said to them, and there's, there's more in this passage, but I'll just give you this part. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Okay? Meaning what? Man doesn't have to submit themselves to do the Sabbath. God made a Sabbath because it's good for us. What does that mean? Like, what do you even do with it? So it says, so the Son of Man is even Lord of the... So who's the Son of Man? Yeah, see, you, you're getting this. Every question I will ask today, the answer is Jesus. yes. So we can get a sense when we read every passage in the New Testament, we get a sense Jesus is trying to like relieve or like help us get something. He's, he's trying to like help us see the point of the Sabbath. So if you read all the passages, we have this one and then like the other ones are like, and Jesus went and preached in the synagogue on the Sabbath. And Jesus healed someone on the Sabbath. And Jesus' disciples ate food that they weren't permitted to on the Sabbath. And they walked more steps than was permitted on the Sabbath. And it's like, what do you do with that? Is Jesus saying, don't have Sabbath? Is Jesus saying, Sabbath is not on Saturday, it's on Sunday, like we clearly read? Or what do we do with that? Well, I actually don't think that the New Testament tells us that we actually are supposed to choose a day to have a Sabbath. But I'm going to tell you about it. Bible Project, any of you heard of them? Some of the most amazing work. If you have not looked at Bible Project, they are really trusted people um, to help articulate and understand the Word of God. They wrote this about the origins of Sabbath, and then I'm going to go into what it is. The idea of Sabbath rest, okay? In the Hebrew Scriptures, there's two main Hebrew words, and this I've heard it before, but this week, this opened my mind. The first word is a word called Shabbat. Any of you heard of Shabbat? Okay? It's a regular get-together that people have. What does the word Shabbat actually mean? Anyone know? It's one part of Sabbath. Yeah, so it's connected to Sabbath, and we typically translate Shabbat with Sabbath. But what it actually means is, I know this is going to be revolutionary. Ready? Stop working. Just stop. Stop working. Never work another day. No, no, so for this period of time, Shabbat means stop working, okay? But there's another word, okay, it's like this. Hang on, let me just explain. It's like, Bible Project uses this as the analogy. It's like you're done your day at work at five o'clock and you click, you click, click out, you stop working, now it's done, this is done, and now we do this, Shabbat, okay? But there's another Hebrew word that is used. I, I don't know if I'm quite pronouncing it right, nuach. Can you get it? Nuach. That's another Hebrew word. And this word is also part of Sabbath. And this word means, or it's, it's another word around rest, Sabbath. This word means to dwell or settle. Okay, and I'm going to explain it. This is not like clocking out at the end of a day of work. This type of rest, this is what Bible Project, how he writes it, is like sitting in front of a fire with a loved one or unpacking a suitcase to stay at grandma's house for the holidays. It's essentially about being restfully present. You know what it's like when you're meeting with someone and you have this quick little conversation and then they're, they're quickly, and it's like off to the next and the next and you're not sure if they like you, if they're speedy, what's going on? It's like restfully present. It's like 
sitting in front of a fireplace with someone enjoying a fire and a good cup of java. Right? It's like restfully present. These are the two that are spoken of when we talk about Sabbath in the Old Testament. God sets up Shabbat and Nuach about the same time. In the Bible's account of creation, God works for six days, creating the world and rests on which day? Seventh, Genesis 2. After six days of bringing this order to chaos, now it's time to Shabbat from the work. Now it's time to stop the work. So only a few verses later, we read that God creates humans and then immediately rests them or settles them with himself in the Garden of Eden. This is Nuach. This is Genesis 2.15. It seems like the idea of Shabbat and Nuach, they go hand in hand, are meant to work together. God leads by example as he rests from his work and then dwells together, Nuach, with his people. So what we're talking about when we talk about Sabbath is to stop and to be with God, to be in his presence, to wait with him, and in community. And you could take it and you could say that the greatest commandment sums up Sabbath, to love God and to love each other. Nuach, Shabbat, to stop work and to be restfully present, a place that God can meet with you, a dwelling place for him to have a home, to stop. Throughout Jesus' life on earth, he goes through all these different things that he's doing. He preached on the Sabbath. He picked grain, all of these different things. And so the question is like, one, why was it so important for the Jewish people? And what was it foreshadowing or what was it foretelling? Why was it important till the time of Jesus? And why is this changing and what does it look like in the new covenant? These are the questions that I began to have. When Jesus went up into heaven, something happened. He sent what? Who did he send? The Holy Spirit to dwell among us, to live with us and indwell in us. So actually, and I'm going to prove this to you, we don't actually need a Sabbath day because we don't need to stop and go somewhere to a temple and have a day set aside for the Lord. We have this great gift from the time of Jesus when the Holy Spirit came upon us that we get to have Sabbath every day. We get to be in his presence every day. And Sabbath is every single day. We, in the new covenant, we get to be with him. We get to walk with him. We get these pockets of time of going back into creation where we put a pause on work and we are present with him. And I'm going to explain it. In the new covenant, Jesus says this in Matthew eleven twenty eight. It's very popular, but keep it in light of this. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you Rest. I will give you Shabbat. I will give you Nuach. I will give you, this is what I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you Sabbath. I'm going to give you time. I'm going to give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, his teaching, and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my teaching or yoke is easy, and my burden is light. This is like the whole point of why Jesus came to die. He's like, no, no, you can have rest now. You can have rest tomorrow. You can have rest the next day. And I'm going to, uh, let me keep going here. The, the Sabbath changed, and I'm going to help us to understand this. So in Hebrews chapter 4, this whole passage, I have to read the entire chapter. This whole passage is about Sabbath rest for the people of God. This, this is what they've believed. So now listen to what it says here. I'm reading in the NIV. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. So he's trying to tie in the old covenant and the new covenant and bring clarity here. For we also have had the good news proclaimed to us just as they did. But the message they heard was of no value to them because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. Now we who have believed enter that rest. Who enters the rest? Those who have believed. Yeah, those who have believed. Yeah, you nailed it. Just as God said, so I declared an oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And I won't go into that right now. And yet his works have been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words. 
On the seventh day, God rested from all his works. And again in the passage above, he says, they shall never enter my rest. Therefore, since it still remains for some to enter that rest, and since those who formerly had the good news proclaimed to them did not go in because of their disobedience, now we're talking about the Jewish people, God again set a certain day. What's that day? Calling it today. It's not Sabbath Saturday or Sabbath Sunday. It's today. So tomorrow it's today as well. This he did when a long time after he spoke through David, as in the passage already quoted, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. This is like the, the, the prophet, David, the king, he is telling of what is to come. They had Sabbath because God's great design was to go back to the Garden of Eden to be with the people he created to be in his presence. And so the new covenant is this, that we have his presence in us, those who believe, and in him we find Nuach, we find Sabbath, we find Shabbat, we find rest with him. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Who gets a Sabbath rest? People of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest. It's on us so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience, those who were not resting or didn't put their faith in him. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him uh, to whom we must give account. The whole point of Sabbath to wait, to stop work, and to restfully or be patient or to be in this space like this is so that the word, the rhema word, the spoken word of God can transform you. Because his word here is one that is alive and active, but if you never stop and you never enter his rest by faith, the word of God can't change you. And so what we've done in the church is we've created a bunch of programs or things. So it's like, I'm going to teach you how to evangelize. Five-step plan. And that cheaps out. Rather, stop. Rest in his presence. Let the word of God change you because it's sharp. His word changing you so that when you go out and you're with people, they encounter the person of truth who is who? Jesus. This is the point. It's like we're pointing to this. Man, I'm over time. (laughs) Therefore, since we have a high, a great high priest who's ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence. This is what it means to rest with him so we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. How many of us need that? You don't need another set of rules. You don't need to know if it's Saturday or Sunday. Every day, we need these little windows of time, pockets of time with him. Going back to Bible Project, and I'll end with this quote and one other line here. What does this look like practically? Does it mean, does it mean attending a weekend church service or turning off work emails or volunteering at a soup kitchen? Does it matter what day you observe Sabbath? Your Sabbath could certainly include those activities, and it could take place on the same day every week. But the text seems to emphasize the purpose of the Sabbath rather than the telling us rules for how to observe it. As followers of Jesus, we aren't required to follow the laws given to Israel at a specific moment at a specific time for them. But there's wisdom because it's foretelling of true Sabbath. Sabbath rest is an invitation to practice for eternity. We're going to work in heaven, and we're going to have Sabbath in heaven. It's where we regularly and intentionally engage in God's rule and reign in our hearts on earth. We have to Shabbat in order to Nuach. We need to stop working to find rest in the presence of God. So when we practice this intentional stop, we make room for him to take up residence in our individual lives. When we do this together, we're making space for it in our communities. Even better, we are taking part in this new creation story, setting the stage for God 
to make his dwelling place, his resting place, here. Tell me that's not brilliant. That is brilliant. Stop your work and get in his presence. I have never heard an argument in my entire life on why personal devotions is a good idea. Um, sorry, that everyone should do personal devotions because God loves you more. Actually, it's not about that at all, and that's what's driven me crazy. It's not a set of rules. You're not less loved because you read your Bible or you don't. But actually, if you want to be transformed and to be mature Christ followers, we actually need to put a pause in the day, and we need to get time with him so that he, by his word, changes us and does this working. It's an invitation that you don't have to enter into, but it's an invitation that he modeled for us. It's so profound for me. It's taking... Little pockets of God's divine presence throughout the day, echoing back to the creation story, but it's taking these divine moments when you're at work, when you're at home, when you're with your family, when you're going to the bathroom or taking a shower or going for a walk. You take these divine moments to allow, just stop and allow his presence, the spirit of God, to dwell with you, to be with you. This is Shabbat. And the reason why we need to pursue the person Jesus, who is truth, is otherwise we don't discover it. Then we go back into rules where we're like, you got to do it this day. You got to do it this way. You must do it that way. That's not what this is about. It's about a person. The discovery of truth is a person. And his name is? To find Jesus, we need Sabbath. And we need it every day. And the world, the, the attack, the assault that the enemy has perpetuated right now is to ensure that you never have a silent moment in your day so you cannot hear his loving presence among you. Just keep it busy, keep it going, nonstop. Be on this always so you can't find Sabbath. My encouragement to you today is don't get stuck in the rule. Actually, the purpose, and this is where we get to be quiet with him, and it doesn't mean you even have to open this, although it's good. It's to stop and give time for him to speak. Let me pray. Team, you can come up as well. That's great. God, I, I really pray that this would be a motivator. Not, not a motivator as in guilt. God, a motivator in terms of like, oh, you want to dwell with us. You, you want to be with us. You, you desire to be together. You, you desire to sit at the fire together with us and with others and, and be restfully present, that, that it wouldn't just be sleep into la-la land, that we would just intentionally stop what we're doing and just be with you. God, would you find that this is a place that you can dwell? We desire your presence here. We desire your presence in our lives, God. Thank you for this day. Thank you for what you're teaching us. Thank you that you are the truth. You're the way. Thank you that you are life. And for that we praise in Jesus' name, amen.